Hello everyone and welcome back to Age of Nagash which is a channel dedicated to Age of Sigma and in this video it's going to be our Why Play Iron Jaws so it's something very exciting it's an army that I am deeply in love with it really really just really cool models and really really fun to play so joining me in this video we're going to have Alex so how are you doing today sir? Yeah I'm good thanks man you? Very well, thank you. Very yeah. well. So this is a video that we actually want to record a little bit earlier, but we heard the FAQ was coming, so we thought that, you know what, we didn't want anything to contradict what we were saying in this video, so we'll wait for the FAQ. So it's all clear now, and it turns out we could have done the video a little bit earlier. But with that aside, um, the reason why Alex is here is because he's a very keen Iron Jaws player. He's actually currently working and painting them at the moment, and um, I thought he'd be a great person to have on the show. He joined me, funny enough, for the FAQ video, but also for the Living City video as well, in case you watch that one. So if you're new to a Why Play video, what is the purpose of it? So essentially, we are going to talk about this allegiance, and this time being the Iron Jaws, and we're going to talk about the law of the army, and then we're going to go over the strengths and weaknesses. And we're going to go over the strengths and weaknesses on and off the table. So that's something that not a lot of people do, because when we talk about off the table, we talk about actually how easy is it to collect, you know, is it that affordable in terms compared to other armies, and how good is it for beginners or people who are already in the hobby. So we'll talk about that, and then of course we'll get to the uh, on the table stuff and talk about the strengths and weaknesses. And then after that, for this video, we're actually going to go over the Iron Jaws Allegiance abilities, and you'll be able to see them on the screen. And then we are going to go over the um, sub legions abilities and we'll go over the command traits, uh, artifacts of power, and the spell laws and mount traits, and the war beats, I believe they're called as well, like the prayers. And we'll go over that and they'll be on the screens as well when you can see them. So um, there's be a fair bit to go over in this video, but obviously some bits will take more time than others because some bits will be easier to uh, sort of narrow down to what is the important bits. So does that all sound good to you, Alex? Sounds great, yep. Yeah. Fantastic. So. The first thing we're going to talk about in this video to help you decide if this is an army for you or not, it's going to be their lore. So, Alex, as the person who plays the Iron Jaws and who fell in love with them the most, who are or what are the Iron Jaws from the Uruk Warclans? Yeah, so the Iron Jaws are just this massive uh, sort of um, group of separate clans um, spread out across. Uh, yeah, all of the realms, um, you know, there are millions, probably billions of them with thousands of clans. Uh, and they're all sort of linked by, like, the only thing that really links them is the fact that they all, um, that Gordrak is kind of their one big boss. But other than that, they're all kind of going about doing their own things. Uh, each clan, you know, has a very different style, has a very different aesthetic. You know, some of them are very based around, you know, they've like lots of brutes in there. Other Love ones, brutes. you know, might have lots of Gorg runters. Uh, and so on. Um, but yeah, they're all basically mad as anything. Um, they love to fight. Uh, their lore is just hilarious. Um, like mm -hmm. some of the stories that you that you read are just just brilliant. Um, because all they want to do is fight. They get stronger by fighting. Um, I've got a few examples of the sort of funny lore stuff that I really love from the battle tone. So I'll get to that later. But sorry, crack on. No, yeah, I was, I was just getting to the end. So if you want to crack on with any. I, stories and I can add anything at the end. Well, so the Iron Jaws, what I will say just now as well is I have done a dedicated lore video for the Iron Jaws. So obviously this will just be a bit of a summary. So in case you want a bit more of a deep dive, check that out. If you want the best lore video for the Iron Jaws or the series, please check out 2 Plus Tough, uh, Doug, because he over there on 2 Plus Tough does a fantastic job of the Iron Jaws. So what we will do here is we'll give you sort of like a bit of a taste of them. So essentially, might makes right it's about the biggest and the strongest and they are the biggest and strongest uruks out there uh, the bone splitters are good but these guys are the biggest and strongest you see like literally the huge armor plates they have on them so if you look at the brute and have this very like sort of like crude armor on them that's actually because this iron is ripped apart with their own hands and then made armor the uh ard boys uh, interestingly are the only ones that can actually like smith armor so they're the only ones who can actually forge it which is cool um the whole thing, I think you've also mentioned as well, Alex, is the, um, I'm going to get this wrong no matter how I pronounce it, it's the WA. I think that will help 50% of you. The other 50% can let me know in the comments. Has, what is a WA? So if you guys don't know, essentially it's their call to war. And it's war 
said in a sort of like Cockney accent. I think that's all it comes from. It's a very old word games workshop came up with probably in the 80s, roughly. So essentially, it is their call to war. And if you look at, if you look at um, just from our own history, when us humans have gone to war, we always have a mission or we always have a purpose. We always have an end game of what is the objective to achieve here. The Iron Jaws just say war, it's their war cry, and then they don't do the other bit. They just go on a rampage. And on this rampage, as you would think as a, like a long out war across the mortal realm, surely the momentum of this uh, Iron Jaws uh, war clan will fade as it loses warriors and everything else. It'll get smaller and smaller and smaller until like it just like sizzles out. But actually, there's a snowball effect to this because the bigger the warg and the more continuation it goes on for, it just draws more and more war clans to it. Because as you mentioned, Alex, the Iron Jaws aren't just like, we are the Iron Jaws, we all live in one big clan. It's like shattered and splintered clans that are everywhere, but they will unite under this, uh, like a very powerful warlord, as we've seen Gordrak's done that as well. I have done a lore video on Gordrak in case you want to check that out as well, dedicated to himself. Um, is a great example of how he's managed to bring so many um, Orc War Clan Iron Jaws, like War Clans together. And um, they're just like, and that's just like sort of talking about like what is their purpose and what's their game that. But apart from that, they just have, but for a laugh, like generally like a really fun army. Fun is the word I would use. For example, they count up to five. So that's why everything, as we'll go through later in the rules, there's a lot of things involving the word fist because you know. Five, right which is quite cool there's also a bit in the law that says um occasionally like some iron jaws out there have been able to put one hand next to the other and then they can count up to 10 and then rumors are like this is just myths and legends like no one really believes it but there's even been some iron jaws that can put their hands together and then their feet and then they can count up to 20 but you know that's just that's just a lie isn't it alex i don't think any iron jaws has managed to do that no, I don't believe it, no. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, that's, you know, that's not just double digits. That is, well, the minimum double digit time too, isn't it? So, yeah, I find that sort of stuff really funny. I've got, like, some stories I want to talk about, but is there anything you want to say or add or anything, Alex, to the law? No, like, I think the, the, the interesting thing with Iron Jaws compared to, like, Orcs and Fantasy mm. is, like, it, like Orc and Fantasy, it used to be the case where, like, you'd have two clans, they'd, like, clash, and, like, one clan would, like, swallow up the other and get bigger that way. Whereas, like, with the Warg, like, they all kind of sort of, they're all, their one purpose is just to fight. And so all these clans come together, they fight, and then they split off again. Um, so they're, like, a lot more in some ways united by their love of beating up, basically, <laughs> uh, than what the old Orcs were, which I think is cool. Yeah, I, I think it's cool. But they are, like, as far as I'm aware, they are, like, if there's no one else to fight, they will fight each other. Like, they have still got that aspect to them. Which is cool. Um, well, that's often, I think that's often how like the Warg start, isn't it? They they start off by fighting each other, and then they realise that actually <laughs> they can go and fight something else, and off they go. Yeah, and it's like um, if uh, I don't know, let's just say there's like a human uh, uh, town in the way of a you know of a war, and they just come across it, and like people at the town will go like before they die, why us? Why why would they take you know we're just a a small township somehow surviving in the sea of chaos while they attack us and it's just like um you're just in their way and yeah. it's like in their way to what oh nothing really just like in the way of just like this expanding uh i don't want to use the word chaos because obviously that's something else but this expanded destructive force right avalanche um, yeah <laughs> yeah and that's and that's cool because using the words you know destructive avalanche very much plays into what destruction is i know this is nigel's video but it really represents elements of destruction right and that's such a good grand alliance name because that is all this is. It's like a force of nature, the Iron Jaws. It's like, as de uh, if you used Avalanche, so as a devastating Avalanche is, it's all part of, um, you know, nature's way to then clear through to shape new landscapes or whatever. It's, um, or, you know, a tidal wave, you know, all these different things, or a volcano going off. I don't, I'm now I'm literally just listing things that have <laughs> happened in history that have been horrendous, but I apologise. But you see, you see what I'm talking about, Alex. I'm not a monster. <laughs> Please say you see. Okay, so <laughs> going on to like some uh, stories. I thought just a, just a few things. So like, there's one that I remember reading, which was about 
a clan from the Iron Jaws that realised these lizard things come down from the skies when they fight chaos. So this Iron Jaws war clan decided, why don't we strap pointy things to our armour so then the lizard things will fight us because we look like chaos. And they did. They strapped spikes to their armour. Seraphon fought. They were chaos. And they came down to fight them. And the Iron Jaws from that clan didn't survive that long, but they had a hell of a laugh in a great way to die, <laughs> which was quite fun. Um, you also got the guy uh, like called Grot Kicker, who was from the Iron Sons as well. He used to lead the Iron Sons. I think he still does. Um, but the reason how he got his job is the Iron Sons were travelling through, or, you know, warring through, essentially, and they came across a realm gate. And the second command of the Iron, uh, Iron Sons at that moment in time was a uh, Grot Kicker. And he thought, how could he become the boss, you know, the great mega boss of the whole of the Iron Sons? And that was because he told his boss at the time, uh, he should go through the realm gate. And then his boss turned around and, you know, said, like, you what? Why to do that? And then basically Grot Kicker just said, well, you're, you're the best, you're the strongest, you should go through this realm gate. So, uh, so he did. And he went through the realm gate, the boss of the Iron Sons. And little to what he knew, but Grot Kicker knew, is that this realm gate led to the middle of a Chaos Bastion. And when he went through that realm gate and realised that, uh oh, I'm in trouble, his helpful Lieutenant Grot Kicker smashed the crap out of that realm gate so his boss couldn't come back out. And now Grot Kicker is the leader of the Iron Sons. Which I thought was a lovely little <laughs> tale, just like how to get self promotion. That's usually what half their, their lore is, is just the, just backstabbing. Yeah. It, how can I be the big boss? Exactly. It's, it's just like quite, it's quite fun. And when, <laughs> yeah, and then like when the other um, Iron Sons wondered like, does their boss need help on the other side of that? Grot Kicker said, nah, he's the strongest, isn't he? So he'll be fine on his own. And then uh, there's one more, uh, I think it's the Choppers or basically in the old Iron Jaws book, it was the, um, it was the clan that was the blue ones. So I'm pretty sure that is the Choppers. Yeah. And, um, that used to be the leader of that used to be a weird knob shaman who had the skull of the uh, mega boss who used to lead the war clan and weird knob shaman was now the leader because he got the old mega boss to talk to him through his skull which was just fun on the end of his staff and we're, yeah. you know we're talking like a page dedicated of lore to that story <laughs> it's just great fun right yeah for sure uh cool so now we sort of talked about you know uh the element of the Iron Jaws within their lore. And like I said, if you want more uh, lore, go to those uh, references I said. Um, so now we know who they are. A bit of a personal question to yourself, Alex, is why did you choose to play Iron Jaws? Um, yeah, I, I, partly it's uh, an aesthetic choice. Um, you know, they're great. They're beautiful models. Um, they're a joy to paint. Um, but also the play style. Um, I really like armies that play how you think they should play. Um, by which I mean, with Iron Jaws, you know, you imagine as this fast moving sort of wrecking ball that like charges in and just fights everything. And that's exactly how they play. Some armies I feel in AOS, um, you know, you think, oh, they should play this way and they just don't, um, which I'm not a big fan of. Um, so yeah, I wanted just kind of a, a fun fighty army. Um, I've obviously I've got I've got my cities of Sigma, which is kind of all like movement shenanigans and sh and like a lot of shooting. And I just wanted another army which was yeah, you know, just drink a beer and beat up um, basically. Um, and yeah, so far that's exactly what they've been, and I'm loving it. It's a it's a fair point, right? You're buying an army that in the law it heavily is reflected in the models, obviously, but and then in the models is heavily inflicted or you know affected or how it is like on the tabletop and you really can't ask for more than that they're just like i used to play iron jaws a little bit um probably about three years ago and i know they've changed significantly since then but they were still the same as i loved running brutes and i loved the idea of i just charged forward and had a great time and i know that sounds quite basic but it was fantastic right um which which is really cool uh, the other thing I'll say about 
Iron Jaws is that it's kind of like, I don't know, if you're one of those people who likes to go to a tournament and have something to drink when you can when we're all gaming again, and you just want to have a bit of an easy army for the Sunday after, Iron Jaws, oh, lovely, lovely stuff. <laughs> so with that, I want to go into what are the strengths of this army off the table, like and how um, have you found to collect them and paint them? Yeah, um, so... I mean, we've already touched on a lot of it. Mm. Uh, so first off, it's the law. Um, so not only is their law really interesting, but also if you want to, it's incredibly easy to create your own st own fun story for your uh, clan. Um, I'm still kind of working on my um, my law for my clan, but uh, it's along the lines of them being uh, possessed by Zinch. Uh, and as such, they've got like a very purple hue to their skin and they've got uh, very, very blue armor. Um, and that's kind of the direction I'm going with. Um, so that kind of leads on to, there's no, like while, you know, there's three main clans that are reflected in uh, yeah. the battle tome, um, there's no sort of kind of standard paint scheme really for Iron Jaws. You know, you can just go crazy. Um, I know, for a while with Iron Jaws, I was like, oh, like I've just finished painting up a mostly green army in Living City. Do I want to paint all this green skin? And then I was like, actually, no. Like, who says that orcs have to be be green skinned? Um, so, yeah. Um, that, yeah, the, the hobby side of it is great. The models in general are all brand new. The only exception to that is the Art Boys, uh, which are from the end of fantasy. Um, yeah. And for, like, they're... they're they're fine, but they have showed their age a little bit compared to uh, some of the newer models. Uh, but other than that, like the models are amazing. Uh, for anybody who's, you know, especially like getting into the hobby, uh, I can't think of a better starter army to learn how to paint. Um, they've got, you know, very defined muscles, so it's very easy to shade the muscles, or, like learn to like, you know, do highlights and lowlights. Um, a lot of the armor um, is very, very textured, so you can actually do like lots of you know thin highlights on the armor. There's just loads that you can learn by painting this army uh, without being too, yeah, sort of finicky and difficult. Yeah, which is great, right? So there's loads you can do, and like you said, like especially like from a beginner standpoint, it's a good access to uh, get into the hobby to do this army. But also, you know, if you're an avid collector and you thought, you know, I haven't got maybe you've got an order army. A death army and a chaos army. You think I haven't got a destruction army. Why should I do a destruction army? And why should it be Iron Jaws? Um, and you've been painted for a long time. There's so much opportunity. Like I said, you you can make it quite easy. You could do a lot of the army with contrast paints, as an example, or you can go toe to toe because like the detail on things like their muscles, or I know like their armor seems very crude, but you could still go to town doing war paint on their faces as well. Um, it's it's huge. And like what I'd say is also the model range. The R boys, they show their age a bit, but not as bad as some of the other fantasy models that carried over. And considering that the Iron Jaws was an army that was based on um, the Black Orcs and now, you know, the R boys, it really, they still fit into the army really well aesthetically, uh, which I think is cool. And I think um, for, an, for an army, this is, this is something I'll, I'll go into, like a weakness of them off the table, is I was going to say like, Although they have a small model range, it's not the biggest. It's an example that I bring up a lot when I say, like, Lumina for getting quite a few models. It'd be nice if Iron Jaws got another unit or something, which I know people disagree with that, but that's fine. However, the models they do have really do shine. Because, you know, at least they still have a cavalry unit. They have, you know, like a monstrous, kind of monstrous infantry being, you know, like the uh, Brutes. And they oh, have definitely. their... Pardon? I was just saying, oh, definitely. Like they, yeah. yeah they're, like they're, they're, they're very elite infantry. Exactly. Their most basic infantry is, you know, uh, I don't know what the best way to describe it, you know, like Chaos Warrior type, Liberator type stuff. Two wound uh, Ard Boys, right? And then you have a beautiful model being that uh, Mega Boss on Moor Crusher. Right. I, I mean, big shout out to the Mega Boss on foot as well. He is absolutely stunning. Yeah, I actually. So I own him. Five brutes and a weird knob shaman, and they're they're all fantastic. My uh, mega boss is called a uh, trogax because I've got it in the, my story that it's actually got uh, like troll blood in him as well. And it, I the amount of fun I've had with this guy on the table, uh, I had it like one one time he went behind the enemy lines, killed a bunch of skink heroes, and then uh, 
back then he had to kill enemy um, heroes to like level up or like mm -hmm. turn to like get an extra runes and extra attack and he just like had a great time um, really really fun army it's if I was to do another army, it'd be a strong contender, or I can say that. Because even, like you say, just a mega boss on foot, beautiful model, and in the game, um, it's just really fun. Like, I know I'm using the word fun a lot, but I think that is a great way to use to describe this army, <laughs> uh, to be honest with you. And even, like, um, you've got the Wind of Shame, which I like. I think he's pretty cool. I like his staff with the smoke coming out of it. I think it's very good. And then you've got the uh, War Chant, haven't you? Which yeah. is... Very Again, another amazing model. Yeah. And very good. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning, uh, while you know you're saying a weakness is that, you know, a lot of the models are sort of similar uh, in aesthetic. They're uh, back to strength. They're actually quite an elite army. Um, mm -hmm. So although they're often quite similar, um, because, yeah, you know, your standard hard boy is a, is a two is a two wound model, so it's 100 points for five. Um, you're probably only running, mate, like, like 50 to 80, you know, models. You can go less than 50 for sure, but like a norm would be 50 to 80 models on a table, um, which when you compare to some other, you know, horde-style armies is nothing. Yes. Um, it's true. Like, so if, if you want a lot of numbers, uh, it, you can do it, but not as well as some other armies. Like, you know, if you go three battle line units of uh, i don't know in skaven and you go clan rats and like three minimum sized battle line units there's probably going to be more models than you might have in an archer's army as an example um yeah and what i will say is like especially if you watched um the last white play video which to be fair the last one you would have watched was the yoga one but before that it would have been the living city one and there was a ridiculously huge model range to choose from potentially the biggest because you could dive into stormcast and sylvaneth um, and then you compare it to this, you're very limited. But if you love the aesthetic of these models, it's probably not going to be much of a problem for you, is what I would say. Um, because the ways, their playstyle is obviously going to have a, like, it's kind of defined, but there are different ways to play on it um, in the book, which we'll get to in a moment. But um, so with that, what would you say the strengths of the army are on the table and again like i said we'll, we'll crack onto the rules in a bit but just sort of like an overall what are your thoughts on this uh then alex what are the strengths uh of the army on the table yeah so like the strengths of the iron jaws on the table um they hit really hard um they are probably the 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 best or one of the best uh alpha strike armies in the game um they've got uh we're going to it later but they've got a ability called mighty destroyers which means that uh, a unit can move in the hero phase uh what that means is like for example your mega boss on more pressure with a 12 inch move gets to move in the hero phase move in the combat phase, uh, move in the hero phase move in the movement phase and then charge so you're talking about 24 inches plus charging uh so yeah um first turn you know opponent isn't doesn't know what's coming uh you can really cause a lot of issues um they uh, so it's 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 a weird one so as you said they are they're quite a basic you could say easy style of play uh which is great for you know uh, your first army to learn the, learn the game they're amazing uh but actually they've got a huge amount of really fun little tricks and to play yeah. iron jaws actually well um you've actually got a be able to, you've got to really know your army and play it well. So it's yeah, sort of. It's easy to be good, but difficult to play it really well. Uh, yeah, competitively. Like, easy to learn, hard to master, right? Yeah, and, exactly. And I think what what is cool with that is what it's like, especially when you're learning the game as well. And I don't, you know, I'm not just aiming this video at new players, as I've already said. But if you are new, and I know a few people who watch my channel are, if you just want to learn the game as well, and you already like the song, you like the models, like the law, blah blah blah. In game, uh, because like I said you can play it fairly easily without diving into all the little tricks and synergies here and there. Um, it means you can really focus on like objective play or the, the battle plan or the mission or trying to remember what your opponent's rules are because you are going to know how your army plays uh, fairly quickly. Compared to exactly. if, you, if you're brand new and you wanted to go into Zeech, it's a, you know, there's a bit more trickery there um, to try and learn as just an example. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, the, the hero phase, you know, while, you know, you've got us, you've got spell casters. So like, you know, you might be doing like one or two spells. So you're learning about spells. Um, you've got like a few sort of coming from the war chant. You've got a few synergies with um, 
varying auras on them. Um, so it's all learning about you know keeping um, your units close enough to your heroes. Uh, movement, like although as I said, they've got a very fast um, you know potential alpha strike movement. They're actually a very slow army the rest of the time. Uh, everything other than the pigs and the dragon have a four inch move. Uh, so it's really learning about sort of positioning and like way like getting to where you want to be, um, and then yeah, it's all about fighting and picking the right fights. Uh, yeah, it's it's just a really good um, starting point into Age of Sigma. Uh, but as I said, you know, if you're an experienced player, there are still so many fun tricks that just leave you grinning because you're like, I've just done that to you, and your opponent's like, How have you done that? And it's not so much a gotcha moment as just a fun little trick. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, which is great, right? And uh... And just to say, like, you know, talking about the, the strengths on the table, like, you know, they can be very competitive, like... For sure. They, they can be good. Um, so, again, like, sort of talking more on sort of a summary level, what would you say their weaknesses uh, are on the table? You know, sort of things like, what what do they struggle at? Or, like, you know, just match-ups, that sort of thing. What ones are bad for them? Yeah, um, so they lack, uh, I guess you'd call it reach. Um for armies that are, you know, for uh, opponents' armies that are very reliant on small heroes, um, or like just heroes buffing behind enemy lines, um, and a, a, probably a bad example, um, but like you know, skink star priests with, um, you know, uh, buffing up skinks. Uh, you don't really have any. You've got one teleport spell, but other than that, you don't really have any way of reaching uh, for those heroes that you really need to kill. Um, or like another example would be, you know, like Flesh Eater Courts, heroes who are like bringing their models back to life. Um, so that can be quite difficult to work through. Um, they also have very little mortal wound uh, resistance in the army. So anything that's putting out a lot of mortal wounds, uh, you're going to really struggle to deal with. Uh, additionally, like pretty much the whole army is Rend 1. Um, so if you're coming up stuff with you know three two up saves re-rollables whatever uh again you're just having like while you've got a lot of attacks um so by weight of dice you will do damage uh it can still be a really hard time against those sorts of armies and what are your uh, mortal wound output like at that at that point because that's kind of ties into that so yeah so you only so the only mortal wound output in the army yeah is charging uh with your dragon and your pigs they do also. impact hits um but like it's not many it's like two or three per unit so um a, a kind of like so what i'm hearing is that their weaknesses is going against armies with good armor saves yeah jerry so like a, a, a bad matchup for them would be a, a Ishlan guard army from a the I don't know, <laughs> as an example absolutely yeah but you know that'd be hard for pretty much everyone if you go against you know I don't know, Night Horn, you haven't invested too much into Ren, so it swings and roundabouts, right? Uh, so with that, um, I think it's about time we will go into the rules of the army. So, as like we said, we sort of covered, you know, the overall of, you know, the law, the strengths, the weaknesses. Let's actually dive down into some rules. So what we're going to do, I'm going to read it from the battle term as well, and um, I know Alex has got it. And what we'll do is we'll read through, but we're also going to put photos of this onto the screen so you can watch it as well admittedly the photos will be taken with my iphone so hopefully it's not too blurry i think it's turned out all right before so if you can't read it don't worry we'll read it out word for word for you so what i'll do is i'll read to say what the um ability is and stuff and then i'll get your thoughts on it alex so uh the Iron Jaws uh, Walkland, so that's the first part of this uh, Iron Jaws Battle Traits, and the Battle Traits are Brutally Incarnate. So, the first bit is talking about Iron Jaws Warclans, which are like your sub-allegiances for this. So, if your army is an Iron Jaws army, you can give the army the Blood Tooth keyword, or the Chopper's keyword, or the Iron Sun's keyword. All Iron Jaws units in your army gain the keyword, and you can use uh, the extra abilities listed for that war clan, which we'll get to in a moment. And that's just, don't worry too much about that. That's just, if you're a bit new, that's just saying how you can take a sub allegiance, basically. Every, well, most battle times have them. So the first proper one is going to be the uh, battle trait, which is going to be eager for battle. So add one to charge rolls for friendly Iron Jaws units. I'm just going to say you're not failing your three inch charges. And then obviously you can explore on that one, Alex. Exactly, yeah. Uh, there's a few other nice synergies that I'll talk about later on, uh, but right now, yeah, it's nice, you know, 
any plus one to charge is i think it's always under appreciated uh, you, yeah. you kind of take it for granted but every inch with a charge definitely yeah oh. makes a big difference i mean i had a game yesterday uh using like host the ever chosen my varangard charged three inches away from the enemy double one which cost me um like an objective as an example of how important it can be um so no that's good but just to clarify just in case anyone asks that still means that you have to be within 12 inches of an enemy to charge them not 13 yes yeah cool because yeah. just in case i can imagine that coming up so the next question uh, sorry not question uh the next rule is going to be mad as hell so at the end of any phase if any wounds or mortal wounds have been inflicted in that phase on an iron jaws unit that is more than nine inches from any enemy units that iron jaws unit can move d6 which i always say movement is huge in the game this game is one on movement and I know, Alex, you're going to say that's pretty good as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the first thing I'm going to say is it's it's the first of a lot of rules which it plays exactly how you feel like an Iron Jaws army should play. Like, you can just imagine that they're there and, you know, they're getting shot at or, you know, they get hit by a spell and they're just really annoyed. I mean, they're mad as hell. So they just, like, speed up to get into your face. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing more scary than for your opponent than, you know, say they're, like, a shooting heavy army and every time they shoot you... Um, you're moving closer. Uh, it's worth noting that that say you got shot by two units, you couldn't do it both times. It's only at the end of that phase that you can move the D6. Uh, but again, in an army, you know, where most of your units are moving four inches, potentially getting an extra six inches movement is great. Exactly. And we'll, we'll sort of mention this later where, like, as Alex says, it's going to feed into other things you can get, how you can make the most out of it. So the next one is going to be Smashing and Bashing. Just a fantastic title, if I can just, like, commend that bit alone. So um, in the combat phase, after a friendly Iron Jaws unit has fought, if the attacks made by that unit uh, resulted in any enemy units being destroyed, you can pick one friendly Iron Jaws unit that has not yet fought in that phase and that is within three inches of an enemy unit that unit fights immediately before the opposing player picks a unit to fight in that combat phase that unit cannot fight again in that uh, combat phase unless an ability or spell allows it to fight more than once now this is something you're not going to get off all the time but when it does go off i can imagine it can make quite a difference Definitely. Um, yeah, like it definitely adds um, a lot of finesse to your standard like activation. Like normally when you're activating, you'll just like be like, right, that's the most important one because you know my thing hits hard, but that or, but my opponent's thing also hits hard, so I'm going to fight that first. Whereas now you're like, right, like what do I think I can kill? Yeah. Uh, and you're just trying to chain it for as long as possible and get as many activations as you can. And you know normally you know you might get you know. You get one smashing and bashing, and then the next uh, activate you don't kill. Um, but on the flip side, when it you know when it chains for like four or five act activations, it's just the best feeling. <laughs> yeah, I... you're, you're you're just like I have earned this. Um, <laughs> yeah. But the the one risk is is that you know say you go in you know you have one very important fight and one fight where you think you should kill that that unit. If you completely fluff your rolls you're then suddenly left with your important activation uh, there for your enemy to uh, hit you on. Yeah, so it comes with risk, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, there's a slight risk, but the rewards definitely outweigh the risk. Definitely. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty cool. I like how it's Iron Jaws and not just like an Iron Jaws hero or something. So yeah, that that is good. And it's a way for them to... It's not playing in the activation wars as in they fight first, but it's a way for if you go against an army that can't fight first your army can end up a lot of it could end up fighting before any of the enemy units so and, and again it, it's it's all about like playing how they feel you know you can just imagine that you know they're in this fight and they see some other uh orcs over to you know over to one side who have just like beaten up and they're like spurred on because they want to be as big and as strong as them so then they pile in even harder absolutely like it, yeah it just really reflects the rules into how the army should play on the table which i really like Mm -hmm. um, so going on to the command ability, so you get Mighty Destroyers, which is you can pick, uh, so you can use this command ability in your hero phase. If you do so, pick one friendly Iron Jaws unit wholly within 12 inches of a friendly Iron Jaws hero, or wholly within uh, 18 inches of a friendly Iron Jaws hero that is a general. That unit must make a normal move 
if it is more than 12 inches from any enemy units, must fight if it is within 3 inches of any enemy units, and must attempt to charge in any other circumstances, you cannot pick the same unit to benefit from this command ability more than once per hero phase. So again, it's adding to how fast these guys can be, right? As just an example, or you can make them fight. Like, this has a lot of use, I imagine, Mighty Destroyers. Yeah. So this, and one other thing that we will come to later, is what takes Iron Jaws from being good to really good. Um, the, the, yeah, in terms of their speed, uh, it greatly improves their ability to get across the board when you want them to. Um, but like that fighting in the hero phase, like say for example, you know you send your mega boss. So you're going, uh, you've got the second turn within that battle round. You send your mega boss on more crusher in, uh, and you know he takes out. But that, there's that last little bit left. Uh, it rolls over into your turn. Now, normally you'd have to wait and fight and you'd lose that movement, whereas this time you can fight in your hero phase, clear that unit completely out, you can then do your normal movement, and then you can go into whatever juicy stuff is behind it and beat up on that. Um, so, yeah, like a hero phase fight when your units are hitting as hard as they, they are is, yeah, completely invaluable. Um, so that's awesome. Um, I would also... There's a very funny little interaction which i'll talk about um which is basically the charge um so what you can do um so it's, it's, as it says if you're within 12 inches you have to attempt to charge now if you make that charge in your hero phase um what you can then do say you've done it with your dragon is you can retreat um so you could say you charged into the screen you could retreat and fly over the screen into the units behind as long as you end that move uh three inches away or more than three inches away from enemy units, you're fine. And then when it comes to combat phase, because you've charged in that turn, you can pile in and fight. Yep. And cool. it's hilarious. The look on your that's one of the things I was saying, right? The look on your opponent's face when you're explaining what you're doing. Um and it just yeah, it's a way of as I was saying, you know, there was an issue with an iron jaws of, you know, that reach behind your opponent, and that massively helps. Yeah, clearly. And you can really see it here. And like it just again really plays into how if you're choosing this army, as we've already mentioned, you really love the aesthetic and you really love the lore, and you actually get to play like that on the table. So, no, it's cool. And it just gives you an extra trip, like you say, what stacks towards so many other things. So, yeah. I really do like that. So, another command ability you get is Iron Jaws Warg. So, you can use this command ability once per battle at the start of the combat phase if you have an Iron Jaws army and your general is a mega boss and on the battlefield. If you do so, roll a dice and add the number of friendly Iron Jaws units wholly within 8 inches of your general to the roll. If the roll is up to 11, until the end of that phase, add 1 to the attack characteristics of many weapons used by friendly Iron Jaws units wholly within 8 inches of your general. If the roll is a 12 or more, until the end of that phase, add 2 to the attack characteristics of many weapons used by friendly Iron Jaws units wholly within 18 inches of your general. So I imagine you're only going to be going up to 11 because it's Iron Jaws units. Uh, but uh, heroes are units still. Yeah, that's true. But you would still need to have like six units on the board when you're then six Yeah, heroes. exactly. Um, you can do it, but like... Yeah, well, exactly. Like, yeah, because I, I, on usually I would have you know, probably eight to nine units uh, in an army. So it's definitely possible to get over the 12, but it's, it's not to be relied on. Um, and to be honest, like, Iron Jaws are so command point heavy um, that I find myself spending a lot more of my time, you know, putting it onto Mighty Destroyers uh, or some of the other command abilities. Uh, so I, I, I very rarely use the WAG ability, but occasionally it does come up useful. Yeah, which, which is fair enough. So... With that, uh, we've looked at the allegiance abilities, so we're actually going to move on to the sub allegiance abilities. Now, there will be command traits and artifacts and so on to look at, but I think it's best that we look at the sub allegiances first, as it gives you a sort of once you pick your, um, uh, you know, Iron Jaws allegiance, you then want to move on to your sub allegiance. Of course, you don't have to pick a sub allegiance, do you, Alex? So you can um, make your own war clan if you'd like to and pick different command traits. Uh, and artifacts are the ones you get in sub allegiances, but we'll start the sub allegiances first. So the first sub allegiance I want to talk about is going to be 
the uh, well-known because it's often taken, and that's going to be the Iron Suns. So, as you can see on the screen now, the Iron Suns should be there, and then the ability, so the first one, um, is going to be um, Iron Suns Cunning. So, subtract one from the hit rolls for attacks made by enemy units that target an Iron Suns unit in the first battle round. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? If you do like an alpha strike as well, as you were mentioning, um, Alex, that can be pretty useful because then the enemy yeah. is minus one or they alpha strike you, it's still good, right? Or Exactly, you. yeah. Um, yeah, it just protects you from the alpha strike and yeah, it gives you... Uh, it, I'm still on the fence as to whether or not the alpha strike is a good uh, tactic. Sometimes it is. But yeah, if you want to do that, again, it makes you a lot more survivable. Yeah, cool. That's So that's nice there. Is it because some of these abilities you get these sub legions just to be aware they're not all good they can be pretty bad so like it's nice that you've yep. got a good one there and then the command ability is all right get him so you can use this command ability at the end of an enemy charge phase if you do so pick one from the iron sun's unit that's within 12 inches of an enemy unit wholly within 18 inches of a friendly iron sun's hero and more than three inches away from any enemy models that unit can attempt to charge so that's pretty cool, right? Charging in your enemies here, uh, charge race. Oh yeah, it's great. You know, like extra, it's extra opponent. movement again. You know, yeah, just... and say your opponent is just, you know, they've got some really cheap, like some really cheap uh, screen that they're just, like, oh, I'm just going to put this, you know, four inches in front of you, just in your next turn to make you have to like fight it because you can't get around this screen, mm -hmm. and you can just charge in in that phase and kill it. Yeah. Um, also, you know, your opponent might, you know, charge something into you um, and um, they'll be like, oh, I've got this fight. You know, it's five hard boys. I can beat up on them. And but they've forgotten that your mega boss is just next to them. And then you charge in with your mega boss and wipe that unit out. Uh, so, yeah, it's really cool. Again, as I was saying, um, it's a command ability that is great, um, but you're quite uh, limited on command points. So it's it all adds up including this and mighty destroyers and warg so you've really got to be like very selective with when you use it yeah it, it is yeah i can see how you can be selective because you know like say there's so many other command bases you want to do but what i do like about it is i remember reading something about this very similar when the um iron just rules were actually in the uh general's handbook like a year or two ago and they had a similar rule what was you could do it but it wasn't command ability however you had to roll five up which just meant it was unreliable if it worked, fantastic. But if it didn't work, not great, right? At least this, you're spending a resource and you're getting it. So yeah. I do like the reliability there. Then going on to the command trait. So again, this is the one you have to pick. You're going with the iron signs, you can't pick another one. So this is right fist of Dakbad. So I think it was Dakbad got Kigo going to my earlier story. But anyway, so at the start of the first battle round, you receive one additional command point. I mean, more command points are great because we just talked about why you want command points. But it's like so. It's worth mentioning at this stage, like it, okay. that it's only on a mega boss general, is the wording. Uh, so you oh, can. Oh, sorry, take a I, I, yeah. Sorry, no, I so the reason I'm the reason I'm, I'm saying this is you. What you can do to get around this, because this is a bit of a tax, is you can take a weird knob shaman general, uh, and your weird knob shaman uh, has a command trait which. Uh, let me just double check. Okay. Uh, yeah. It? Um, it. I think it's D three. Um, command points, I believe. Yeah, so you get you get D three command points in your first hero phase. Oh, so just a straight so, up trade then, isn't it? So it's just straight up better. Uh, and the only thing you lose is that the war command ability has to be from a mega boss general. Um, so that's the only thing you you really lose by taking a shaman as your um, general. But it's just a way to get around that if you so choose to. Yeah, it's good because the wording on it is um, an Iron Sons mega boss general. So it's not saying yep. the general of an Iron Sons has to be a mega boss. Yes, yeah, exactly. so that's cool. That's nice. Um, always shows that I I skip that bit and I missed that bit. Why it's always good to read every single word because there are little details like that, and then it opens a new door. Because um, always just just one's a bit sad, really, isn't it? I think uh, with that. Yeah. So, like, I mean, obviously it's not bad, but like it's. There's a lot, a lot of command traits that are similar to this are like an, an extra D3, right? So Exactly, yeah. Okay, then on to the Artifact of Power. So the first Iron Sun's Mega Boss uh, to receive an Artifact of Power must be given the Sun Blessed Armor. So the Sun Blessed Armor, which is worse than the Ren characteristic of attacks that target the bearer by one to a minimum of uh, dash. So 
what I will say here as well is that, again, you're probably going to say it, is you have to give it to an Iron Swan's Mega Boss. So if you don't include... Uh, wait, actually, the first... But you, no, you don't have to receive it. You don't have to give it the artifact, though, do you? So... I mean, yes, I mean, you don't, but you always, you're always going to have a Mega Boss in your army and you're always going to want to put an artifact on him. Um, okay. So you, you'll bad, almost bad. always see some blessed armor in um, an Iron Sun's army. And that's keyword mega boss, so it can be a more crusher, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's actually it's really good. Yeah. Um, you know, like your mega boss on more crusher. Well, they're both they're on a three up. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, essentially taking them down to a two up um, against anything with rend, it's good. Um, there are better artifacts in the general, um, like artifacts that you can just mm-hmm. take. Um, but it's certainly not bad, uh, and you know, if you if you want, you can kind of with the mega boss and more crush it. You can either go for it to be an absolute wrecking ball and just destroy, but die kind of easily, or you can make it a lot more survivable. And if you're going that way, Sun Blessed Armor is the best one. Nice one, decent. So going on to the next one is going to be a different uh, sub leaders now. So basically, if you're very new, we covered the yellow one. Now we're moving on to the red one. You know, it's paint by numbers right at this point so <laughs> going on to blood tubes which i just want to say iron suns and blood tubes were always the first uh two ones that were like uh dominant in the rules because they were like the first two to get like uh battalions less sub allegiances so blood tubes the first thing you get for their ability so as you can see a bit of a trend now everything gets an ability a command ability a command trait and an artifact. So they're generic ability. So add one to run and charge rolls for blood tooth units. Um, the charge roll modifier is in addition to the eagle for battle. Mark. So it's nice that they include that bit. So now you're um, at least charging four. Yeah, uh, exactly. So you've got a minimum charge of four, uh, and it's the only pluses to run you get in your whole army. Um, like the only oh. thing you can get, which, as I said, when you know your brutes are moving on a, a, a four-inch move, um, just getting that extra one inch on the run really useful. What's what's running? I know, like this sounds like a bit off topic. What's like running and charging in the army? Is that a thing? I know you get uh, the extra. Week. No, I don't think there's any. No, there's no access to it. Okay, but you, if you could move up and then you could then charge in your enemy's charge. So like they still play. Like just... yeah, exactly. Uh, and when we talk about our boys, there's some really crazy charge numbers that you can pull off with them decent okay so that's good but still can only charge an enemy unit if it's within 12 inches of you um then going on to the command ability say so break through the line so you can use this command ability at the end of your combat phase if you do so pick one friendly blood tooth unit that fought in that combat phase and that is wholly within 24 inches of a friendly blood tooth hero that unit can make a normal move but cannot run or retreat so that's cool. So essentially, obviously, it just can't run, but it means it has to, you know, just not be within three inches of an enemy unit, essentially. Yeah. So like, it's 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 cool. Uh, it's very situational. Um, again, it helps with that movement that we talked about. But like, the best use I found for it is very often uh, your opponent will screen out just on that six-inch line from the objective, just so as you can't, you know, even if you pile in, you can't get on the objective. Uh, what this means is, you know, you can fight, you can kill everything in that unit, and then you can make your move and you can get yourself that extra point, which, you know, if that's late in the game, that might win you the game. Yeah, it, it could well do. It could well do, couldn't it? So I I just love all these... I love all these movement shenanigans, right? I always say how important... It's so thematic, yeah. yeah. It's, they're, just, they're just fun. And that's what I'm saying. It's, like, it's very easy to, you know, sort of... You know, plod around and fight, but knowing the right time to use all these command abilities and all that kind of stuff, yeah, mm. it's cool. And talking about, you know, just moving for a second, um, like me and you had a game in like a, a small tournament I did on my Discord, and you won that game by 0.1 inches. <laughs> like, just to show like how massive it can be. Like on TTS, you can get that yeah. close, but just like, you know, it's so vital. Um, so going on to the command tree... So a blood tooth general must have uh, this command trait instead of one listed on page fifty six. So I'm actually just going to read the top bit now all the time when I don't need to, just because I missed that one thing, aren't I? So the uh, the command trait is get that realm gate. So if there are any baleful realm gate terrain features on the battlefield when the general uses the iron jaws walk. Command ability, uh, add two to the dice roll that determines the effect of the ability. Now, this just feels a 
bit of a funny one to me because I'm like, how do you define if there is a realm gate on the table? It's a whole load of rubbish. Like in theory, a Beowulf realm gate is a specific bit of yeah. terrain that uh, Games Workshop makes. But so, like, unless you're walking around carrying one in your bag and asking people, like, oh, do you you've mind? You've got to like, ask, haven't you? And it's like, could you, I... could you do me a favour? Am I allowed to put this realm gate on? It's it's nothing. It's a tax. Exactly, and it's, and it's just like um, so. They had a rule very similar to this. Um, like we're talking about two, three years ago, right? And you think they would have cleared it up in the battle zone because it, it's just like um, it's, you're just saying to your opponent, "Can I? Do you mind if I put this thing on the table? It just gives me a, a inherent benefit." And it's like, what what could it add towards? Uh, my units like once per game getting an extra two attacks. I'm pretty sure your opponent is probably going to say no unless they're just like yeah. up for a massive laugh or something like. Which is sad, right? Because it doesn't really make any sense. Um, no. Okay, so Artifact of Power. So the first Blood Tooth Mega Boss... Okay, so it's useful because it does a Mega Boss. Uh, to receive an Artifact of Power must be given the uh, Quick Duff Amulet. So once per battle, the bearer can uh, cast the Great Green Hand of Gork Spell from the Law of the Weird, which we'll get to in a moment. If they do so, the spell is automatically cast... Do not roll, and it cannot be unbound. So that's the teleport spell, right? Like we get to yes. the specific of what it does, but you get to do the teleport spell for free, which is pretty. When you go against a dominant magic army that will just unbind anything you cast, that's pretty good. Oh, it's like it's the, re this, the that artifact is the reason you take blood tooth. Yeah, because um, otherwise right. it's got other. It's got other. Uh, so like I'll talk about it now with this. Mm -hmm. So. Um, one of the best plays you've you've got with the uh, quick death amulet is to te is to teleport a big block of hard boys. Uh, the reason being is that you've already got plus two, to, so obviously you've got to end up nine inches away from uh, any enemy models. Um, they've already got plus two to charge, one from the iron jaws abilities, one from their abilities, and then hard boys get another plus two because of their musician. Um, so rather than needing a nine inch charge off the teleport, they now only need a five inch charge off the teleport. Um, so yeah. you can really lean into that. And, you know, if you know that you're going to be getting that teleport and nothing can stop you, um, then, yeah, you know, you can get a block of 20 or 25 hard boys and just put them in your opponent's face and be like, right, you deal with that. And I'm going to get all the objectives. Yeah, exactly. And just to even like you say, like a five inch charge, um, if you, you've got enough movement in this army to then make a hero be within six inches of them or your general within 12 to then give them a re-roll if they needed to. Yeah. Like, but most of the time you're getting a five inch charge. You're unlucky if you're not. Yeah, exactly. Well, I've, I've played quite a few games. Unless I'm making Sage Rock out and it tends to not go my way. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, all right. And uh, that that's it for the Blood Tooth. So, going on to the next one, the Choppers. Can I just say, names, fantastic. Like, I, I just hope the people who came up with the book had a great as much time as I am reading it, right? Um, so, not gonna lie, like when it comes to doing storm hosts and everything, um, I will not be as enthusiastic at all. So, going on to the abilities, so you've got a Vandal Horde. So, you can reroll charge rolls for choppers units that are within 12 inches of a train feature uh, that is fully or partially in enemy territory. That, that's pretty, like compared to the last train feature thing we saw, this seems mm -hmm. more viable, like, right? Oh, definitely. And yeah. again, if you, if we take it back to so the not hand of well, just spell, within, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. There's always going to be a bit of terrain somewhere um, that counts as that. And yeah, you know, if you've got that hand of gork spell and you've got plus three to ch charge on your hard boys, you fail it the first time. You're like, oh no, sweat. I'll just roll again. Yeah. Um, it makes again the teleport charge a lot more uh, reliable. And just in general, you know, often on some of the battle plans, heart, like you know. Half of the uh, board is your uh, opponent's territory. You then go another 12 inches. So basically, any um, or a bit more, basically over half the board. Um, if you're within 12 inches of that, you're rerolling charges. Great. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Just bear in mind, uh, it has to be wholly within your opponent's territory, not like. Is it not? Is it not just within? Uh, yes, that within 12 inches or things yeah. that are. Oh, or partially. Sorry, my mistake. Uh, fully or partially. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. So, I don't know. Most terrain on the board, probably at that point. And, and it's only within twelve. So yeah. So actually, if you think about, you know, you've basically got three quarters of the board on some battle plans where you're rerolling charges. Yeah. And this army likes to go forward, right? So it's going to be rerolling <laughs> most of its charges. That, that's yes. really good. 
That's really good. I also want to say, um, so how I painted up the oranges I have, they're, they're yellow and red, and I really like that colour scheme. But the blue one is very nice. Actually, I'm, I haven't just brought this up to try and be, big you up or anything, but you've painted yours blue, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mine are, yeah. yeah, a bit of a brighter blue than what Dutch choppers normally are. But yeah, very bright blue. And they've got the like the uh, uh, racing checks almost, but a blue and white, haven't they, on them, which is quite nice. Yeah. Um, cool. So, uh, going on to the command ability. So, uh, Rabble Rouser. So, you can use this command ability when you use a friendly Chopper's War Chanter Violent Fury ability. If you do so, you can pick up to three different friendly Chopper Brutes units and or Chopper Ardboy units to be affected by the ability instead of one friendly Ardboy unit. Is this the one that gives them plus one damage? Yes. Okay, so the important one, right? Just to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, well that's... That's pretty good. Um, yeah, like it is good. Like, um, I, I'm still undecided on it. Like, because normally you so like it's it's normal that you'll take two war chanters in your army. Uh, with the current meta of you know Kairos being able to do like a flat six mortal wounds anywhere on the board, or you know with shooting anything like that, just taking one five or so six wound hero. Um, to provide that huge buff, it's really risky. Um, so generally, you take two anyway. Um, so you've got those two providing the buffs. I mean, um, like, when I fought against, just say, when I fought against Iron Jaws, I only fought them like a little bit since the new book, but a, a week or so ago, uh, I was playing Ostrich Bone Reapers and I had one catapult and I was just like, any mini, that thing's going to die um, first, right? Because he only had one War Chanter and as soon as it dies, he's not getting that plus one damage to his um, Iron Boys. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because the units have to be wholly within 15 of the War Chanter, you're going to have to be pretty bunched up on a big table um, to make the full use of that command ability. Like, it's, like, normally I'm struggling after turn one to have one unit within range of my War Chanter, let alone, um, like, three units. Yeah. yeah so, again, situationally, it could be really good, but most of the time you won't be using it. First thing that came to my head is you just get it right, you just do it, and then you do smash and bash, and you get the first thing off, and then you attack with everything before the enemy attacks, and then you get like plus an extra damage on all those. I know that's like a very extreme example, but I could just imagine it being beautiful. Exactly, it, it can happen, but it's yeah, it's un unlikely to. Cool, that's fair enough. Um, so going on to the command trait, so a chopper's general must have this command trait instead of one listed on page uh, fifty-six. So. Uh, Checked out. So add two to the Brody characteristics of friendly chopper units while they are wholly within 18 inches of the general. So it does mean like your bravery isn't great in this army, right? Uh, our boys is pretty good. Uh, their base is eight, um, and then you obviously get pluses for unit size. But I know yeah, things six, like brutes being bravery six is really scary because you're you're there. You lose one unit and one model, and you're taking a battle shock test, and it. Yeah, it's no fun. Yeah, so, I mean, I'll be honest, this sounds a bit more, you know, like, boring, but it's good, right? And to be honest, you compare this to the last one, where it's like, if you can put a realm gate down on the table, it's a lot better, because it's actually going to Oh, this, this is really good. Yeah. Like, there is, if you're looking pure competitively, um, you generally take our boys every time over brutes. It's pretty close, but you normally do. Uh, however... If, like, one of the reasons is that they're the two difference in bravery. Um, so, yeah, if you can give your brute, if you can babysit your big block of brute so they've now got plus two to their bravery, yeah, you laugh. Uh, it's really good. And the other same with the pigs. Like, the pigs can potentially, you know, if you lose two out of six uh, pigs, um, you're taking battle shock. Um, and just losing one of them, you know, if you roll a six, that's a bad time because right. they're expensive. And the other thing to say is that, um, as we've talked about some of the command abilities so good in this army, that you might not have a command point left for inspiring presence like all the time. Oh yeah, that that was very true. Yeah, most of the time you won't. Yeah, which which is big. And like you are multi wound models, so unless you get hit really hard, hopefully you won't lose too many. So the extra two can make a difference. Yeah. Um, cool. So then going on to the artifact of power. So the first. Chopper's Weird Knob. Okay, so not Mega Boss, but Weird Knob. In general, to receive an artifact of power, it must be given the Magnus Skull Staff, which I think is... I'm going to read the law on this one, because I think this is what I was talking about earlier. So, 
Magnus uh, Skull Staff. So the skull mount atop this staff once belonged to a mighty mega boss, and it is still capable of inspiring a full-blooded war. Yes, this is exactly what I was talking about, and I'm glad it's still in the law. So the bearer is treated as having a the or it's having the mega boss keyword for purposes of the Iron Jaws War Command ability. Okay, so it basically outlines why this is important. But does that mean you can... Uh, no, ignore me. Because I was like, then can you give a Mega Boss a command trait? Obviously you can't because you've already got... The no, it's here, just so. it's just for that ability. I mean, it's still good though, right? Well, I mean, you're going to have a Mega Boss then. Well, yeah, okay. You explain it to Yeah. Me. <laughs> um, like, it's, it's fine. Um, like, if you've got... A sh you know, if you've got a shaman, like cool. Um, but cool. generally, I'd say, you know, you're taking mega bosses. You're putting your artifacts on the mega bosses where you can. Um, so unless you've got the artifact spare, um, but honestly, it's a little bit of a tax, I'd say. Cool, but not as much of a tax as the realm gate thing. No, I mean it's definitely got its use. Um, yeah, it's, but, it's just I, yeah, like it's not, it's like not said, amazing. I read the narrative. I think the narrative is really cool, but like I can see how you know it's not it's not best. So we've actually reviewed now the three sub allegiances you've got for Andres. This has turned into a long Y play because usually these Y play videos now I've gotten to just review sub allegiances. But the Oric War Clans book is a bit funny, I and mean, we were talking about this just before because it's essentially the tome for your orcs in Age of Sigma, but the Oric War Clans isn't actually a allegiance. So the three allegiances in this book are going to be Iron Jaws, your um, Big War, or your uh, Bone Splits. So this is actually a wide play reviewing the allegiance and the sub allegiances. So that's why, just in case you're wondering why it's a bit of a long one. Um, but we will go over the um, command traits and stuff now. And what we'll do is, um, I'm just going to like, for example, we'll look at the command traits now. And I'm just going to ask you, Alex, um, out of the six we have here, um, what ones stand out to you? So obviously, guys, uh, you can see it on the screen as well, just in case you want to read it yourself. Yeah, so basically the command traits, if you take a clan, your command trait is locked in, um, so you can't take any of these. You have to go clanless yeah. uh, in order to yeah, not get that. Uh, and what I would say, there's, basic, there's one, maybe two, uh, which you take. Um, so the best one is Brutish Cunning. Uh, command trait, which is uh, once per battle, your general gets to use the Mighty Destroyer's command ability without spending a command point. Uh, as we discussed, Mighty Destroyers is one of the things which makes Iron Jaws great. Um, sounded a bit like Trump there. Um, make them great again. I can make, yeah, exactly. Um, so getting to do that without spending a command point every single hero phase, it's amazing. Um, so that's the one that if you go clanless 90% of the time you take, the other one worth mentioning is Ironclad, Ironclad which is yeah. adding one to save rolls for your general. Um, a mega save, boss. Right? No. Mm? Two up save at that point, isn't it? Exactly. Um, yeah. So, you know, having him rolling around on a two up save, um, it's pretty nice. But yeah, the competitive choice is if you want to go clanless. And like Brutish Cunning is good enough that it makes going clanless um, definitely worthwhile. Because, um, yeah, you're basically getting five command points for free if you keep your general alive. Well, it's once per battle, though, isn't it? Oh, no, it's oh, once sorry, per once per, I've massively overread that. Yeah, once per battle round. Okay, yeah, yeah, cool, yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, I can see why people might want to give Ironclad to them more Crusher, though, just to make it tanky. But, yeah, I, I agree the British cunning is better. Um, so, uh, the next one we have are the Champions of the Weird. So, this is for your uh, Weird Knob Shamans, no surprise. Uh, we've got three here. Now, I can't imagine... You're making them your general most of the time, but so the only exception was uh, when we were talking about was it Iron Sons where the art yeah where the artifact gives you yes. yeah. uh, not the the command trait gives you one uh, command point. Uh, there's Dead Cunning uh, yeah. which gives you D three extra command points if your Weird Knob Shaman is your general. Um, so you can actually take that in the Iron Sons, uh, but other than that, you gen. I mean, you could take Master of the Weird. Um, if you wanted to go for more spell casting, uh, plus one to cast and bind and dispel was always good. Um, but yeah, in general, you're not seeing those command traits very often uh, outside of Iron Sons. Yeah, fair enough. Fair point. Um, 
So then going on to the artifacts of power. So this is for the uh, mega boss ones, and it's the boss's horde. So out of these six, what ones stand out to you then? They're all pretty good, to be honest. Uh, uh, so we the we one can go that through I, them all. I, I don't mind. Yeah. Um... So well, let's just talk about yeah. armor of gore. Yeah. All right. So if the unmodified save roll for an attack made with a melee weapon that targets the bearer is a six, the attacking unit suffers one mortal wound after all of its attacks have been resolved. Right. Yeah. Uh, this is a bit weird because um, your mega boss on foot. And one of the loadouts for your Mega Bus on More Crusher has this exact ability, as far as I can tell. Um, All right. So, yeah, so like what you can do is you could put that on, because basically the Mega Bus on More Crusher has uh, one uh, loadout which is eight attacks, the other loadout which is six attacks, and the one which is six attacks uh, gets that Mortal Wound kickback. So, you could take the eight attack uh, version and then give it that mortal wound kickback, which is kind of nice. Because this wouldn't stack, so, presumably, would it? Uh, no, it wouldn't stack. No, yeah. I wouldn't think so. How, uh, just a quick question, just remembering how it works and stuff. Um, so, let's say you've, you've got a mega boss on War Crusher. He's surrounded by a horde. The enemy chucks 60 attacks at you. Um, it would, it would count all those dice, wouldn't it? Not just, obviously, the wounds that slay him if he dies. You would actually, for any sixes, you would roll yeah. 60 save rolls, wouldn't you? And then also... Yeah, I think I think so, yeah. Because it, it, that's diving very deep into it. It is, but it like, is. Because you only allocate wounds individually after the save roll. Yeah. So you still roll all of your saves prior yeah. to that, could be good. I believe. Mm. But I could oh. be wrong on that. Yeah, there's a melee weapon yeah. as well, so you know skinks are still going to get away. Um, so, yeah, that's all right. Like I say, you know, if you if you're sort of like, oh, I want to go with this different loadout for the more uh, more crusher as an example with mega boss, you can then take this as well, so you're getting best of both worlds, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, you have got the destroyers. So pick one of the bearers' uh, melee weapons once per battle at the start of the combat phase. You can add three to the damage characteristics of that weapon until the end of that phase. Now, before you tell me your competitive thoughts on this, what's good, what isn't. That just sounds really fun. Like <laughs> really, so like, fun. that, that Mega Boss is having a hell of a time. Because that what yeah. I, I guess what five damage at that point, maybe. Uh, yeah, five damage if you've got a war chart and a six damage. Yeah, like great, great. Fun. And then even so, like you get this guy on you... foot as well, couldn't you? Like that. I know he wouldn't so, be the so, best thing, but it'd be great. Yeah, so like th this is the fun thing, right? So both Mega Bosses uh, have an ability called Strength from Victory. Which is any command, uh, any combat phase where they kill an enemy model, not unit, just model, they gain one to their attack characteristic and one to their wound characteristic. Fantastic. So cool. if you imagine if you've been going around for like five, let's say you've you've done really well and you've got like five uh, five combat phases under your belt and you've killed a model every single time, uh, your mega boss on foot, who's a hundred and forty point hero, has now got eleven attacks. <laughs> you then you then pop, you make that eleven attacks. Hitting on twos, wounding on threes, minus one rend, six damage. <laughs> How like he absolutely blows up. I mean, what a reward for getting all those boxes ticked right. But if you do, by God, is that going to be fun? Yeah, I've ha I've had it happen. I've run destroyer a bit. I, there's an artifact I use more often now later on. Um, but yeah, when you when all the uh, stars align, that like I've done. I think it was. 35 wounds to Arkan, um, Arkan saves, yep. um, with just a 140-point foot hero. Brilliant. Like it's mental. Yeah. Brilliant. And like just to say, I think we did mention it, just in case we didn't, um, we will be looking at the battalions as part of this. So a lot of the times you go, oh, this is a cool artifact, but if you're going to sub allegiance, for example, you don't need to really bother with the artifacts because sometimes you don't take the battalions, but you will, you can easily take battalions in Iron Jaw. You, al you almost always do yeah, take So you a, will be getting one. that extra artifact. So uh, you're not going, oh, well, to get this, I'm not going to be able to take a sub allegiance as an example. You, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, best of both worlds. So yeah. the uh, next one, which is uh, Dorvin of Mork. So roll a dice each time a wound or mortal wound is allocated to the bearer. On a six, that wound or mortal wound is negated. Uh, I don't really like it. Right, like, I know it's no, it's, like, it's, it's just not a the six. Fun. Yeah, it's it's the, it's yeah. You know, say you stack that with ironclad command trait. Um, so it's two up, six up. 
Uh, and then there's also a mount trait, which we'll talk about later. Um, but, you know, you can definitely stack it to make your mega boss or more crushes super survivable, um, which is a valid way of playing because they still put out a lot of damage unbuffed, but it's not the fun way to play it. <laughs> no, exactly. Give it the destroyer. <laughs> like, that's the yeah. fun way. Then you've got the golden tooth. So do not take power shock tests for friendly Andros units while they are wholly within 12 inches of the bearer on a mega boss and more crusher again bigger base so you're making the most of it um and we just say battle shock is a problem for them yeah um i'd actually run it on if i was going to take it i'd take it on a foot mega boss and i'd run say 15 brutes and mm. i'd just have him sat next to the brutes um yeah because he's giving that's them a where it anyway, comes in he? yeah well then they're just not taking... yeah he, he can buff them up he can help out but most importantly your brutes aren't running um and that's the as i said that's the issue with brutes so again it's got a place if you're running brute heavy for sure um but it's not one like that's the thing all like pretty much all of these are good um but there's just a few which really shine yeah like the next one i think is quite good isn't it so you've got a metal ripper's oh, claw yes. so pick one of the bearers melee weapons change the ren characteristic of that weapon to a minus three before applying any other modifiers to that weapon's rend characteristic. So minus three rend, very rare in the game, and very lovely if you're the one wielding it, right? Yeah. Um, so like, if you put this on um, a Mega Boss or more Crusher, um, but like before you make him get any better through Strength and Victory, he's gonna have um, if he's yeah if he's buffed up well, he's gonna have eight attacks uh, at rend three damage three. And eight attacks at Ren two damage three, um, yeah. Like there is very little in the game that can survive that. Yeah, I had him. Um, what did he do? He charged uh, when I played against them with my uh, uh, oh, sorry, Bone Reapers, as I mentioned. Uh, I had ten Death Riders charged by a so that's the cavalry for Bone Reapers charged by a Mega uh, Boss and War Crusher with this artifact, and I think in one round of attacks he like killed uh, I think about seven of them. Right, and they're like three wound each, like including the mortal wound impact damage and stuff. And it was just because, like, for example, on, on this weapon, you know, minus three rend, it's just I've, I've got a four up save. And a lot of most things in game obviously have four up saves, you know, as like an average. So mm -hmm. just no save. But but again, like, you know, even put it on a foot uh, mega boss. Yeah. Like, you know, I had a game this week where he went into a uh, Celestant Prime who's, you know, what eight wounds on a three up save um but it's like 300 points or something and he just minced him and it's like well this 140 point hero is paid for himself twice and that's the thing with the mega boss on foot is he almost always yeah makes his makes his points back uh, especially when he's got an artifact like that 100 percent, it's great and then the next one is and the final one is the boss skewer so add one to the bravery characteristic of friendly orange or units holy uh, sorry, while they are wholly within 18 inches of the bearer, and subtract one from the brave characteristics of enemy units while they are within 12 inches of the bearer. Um, I think I'd rather go the golden tooth. I was going like, to say exactly yeah. the same, yeah. Because I know you're earning some one from the enemy, but and I know like that could be huge. And obviously, you're pre presuming you're playing against ogres, and you're presuming that the Mournfang cavalry, you know, as an example, haven't got inspiring presence. They're gonna roll badly, and then you make another one run away, right? But you know those perfect storm scenarios do not always happen. So yeah, yeah, just go uh, golden tooth, I reckon. Uh, if you want to yep. go the bravery way, of course. Um, and then we go to the uh, weird trinket. So this is obviously for the weird numb shamans. Um, so we've got three here. So the great green vision, the um, amber bone horde, and then the uh, shamanic skull cap. So or cape even. Is there any here that are useful? Yeah, like in simple terms, great green, great green visions is great. You know, a four up to get a CP in each hero phase. Mm -hmm. On average, that's getting you two to three uh, command points across the game. Um, as we said, you know, command points are really uh, an issue for uh, Iron Jaws. So yeah. the more ways you can get command points, the better. Uh, and Shamanic Skullcap, plus one to cast. Uh, again, you know, a lot of game plans with Iron Jaws revol rev uh, revolves around uh, the Hand of Gork spell, mm -hmm. and it's got a casting value of a 7. So any way that you, which is obviously pretty high, um, so any way you can get the cast down is great. So, so those two are cool. Plus two. Yeah, they're definitely worth taking, depending on... I think it depends on your game plan. Like, if you're wanting those teleports, go uh, Skullcap. If you're wanting, you know, more Mike Destroyers and that kind of thing, go Great Green Visions. 
And you also, um, yeah, exactly. And you get, you, so basically for your win of shamans, you can get plus two to cast for one of them. Yeah, exactly. Which which can be very good. Uh, I do sign yeah. the center of my Archer Regent and flesh it at courts. Um, if I, I'm just sorry, I'm just reading the other bit. Like, if you kill an enemy wizard with him, he also knows their spells, right? Uh, uh, yes. Cast. Okay. But when is that? When is that ever going to happen? <laughs> uh, exactly. Like, what he I was going to say. Pretty much no attack profile, and <laughs> yeah, if you're he, keeping him at the back out the he's way. He's good for a wizard, all right. He has, I think, <laughs> D three attacks, and that's it. Like compared to one, um, he what... has he has technically killed a terror geist for me, but it did have one wound left. <laughs> did you know the spells of the terror geist? Was it was it useful to make sure if you had any he fleshier? Did you have mercenary have... fleshier court units? So then you could give them the spell from the terror guys. That would have been beautiful. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't have the skull cape. Ah, oh, I know. Sad no. time. If if only, if because oh, I imagine you had six flares in your list, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. right. So then yep. going on to uh, this is fun. So then going on to the Iron Jaws uh, mount trait. So I will read the uh the bit at the top just so we understand so if an Indra's army includes any heroes mounted on a maw crusher one of those heroes can have a mount trait declare which hero has the mount trait and then choose or roll if you're feeling risky for that trait from the following table you can choose one extra hero to have a mount trait for each war scroll battalion in your army the same hero cannot have more than one mount trait and uh, sorry and an army may not include a uh, duplicates of the same Mount trait. So I just think it's important to read that because I've uh, I found it when I've come across a few people and they will just give um, all of the not just Angels but other armies. They will just give all their mounts mount traits because they think they can. It's always important just to read those things that like I missed out the uh, thing that you could take a weird off shaman to try and get around only getting one command point earlier. It's important to always read the little text because uh, that's useful, right? Because you don't want to turn up to a game and find out you've given bloody all your mounts mount traits you weren't meant to and everything else uh so yeah just wanted to uh clarify that bit so we've got six here any stand out to you i see they're very small so we can just read them what how you feel yeah um i mean there's there's one massive standout one uh which is weird uh which is ignore uh any effects of spells or end spells on a four up um That's you know when there's some really serious magic domination out there. At the moment, uh, yeah. When you can just ignore fifty percent of spells on your mega boss, you know that's amazing. Um, that's kind of making up often for its lack of mortal wound save. So that's the one I always take. Um, can I tell you the one I, I seen... like? Go on then. I agree with you. That's the best one. I like the add one damage characteristic to the mighty fist and tail. Yeah. I it's don't know good. if that's the like, second best, but I just think that. Again, like it's the amount of damage output you can have from these things. But that that's the really fun thing with the more Crusher, is you can kind of you can set it up to be the biggest wrecking ball in the game. Like if you imagine, you know, you can make it uh Ren three, um, you know, plus one to damage on his fists and tails. Um, you can make it yeah, fight in the hero phase of three. Like you can really like lean into that. Or, you know, you can be a bit more conservative and um yeah, sort of Make it that bit more survivable, which I think is where Weird and comes in. And also, like you know, Geminids, for example, like God Geminids. You know, being able to ignore that on a four up, um, that's amazing. Lovely, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, that's cool. And then like, there's, there's other ones there as well. If you really want to play around with more crush So then the next thing to look at is going to be the War Chanter War Beats. So each War Chanter in a, in a uh, sorry in an Andros army knows one warbeat from the following table. You can either choose or roll for that warbeat for each war chanter uh, knows. So each warbeat can only be attempted once per turn regardless of how many war chanters know it. So it's like spells at that point. Um, so mm -hmm. we've got three here. Obviously, the I think it's the one on his war scroll that gives plus one damage, isn't it? Yeah, so it, it's worth noting that the one on his war scroll happens without rolling, whereas these happen on a four up. Um, okay, so yeah, like while the... yeah, exactly. I okay. know oh, they can do both. No, they do both. Sorry, okay. um, and they all happen at different times. Um, 
so like they're one of these things which is like when they go off they're really good and they're really useful but it's not something you can ever rely on because you know on a four up um you've got a 50 chance of it not uh, percent chance of it not happening mm-hmm. um they're all pretty good uh normally so i normally take two war chanters normally i give them both get and beat um get and beat is at the start of the charge phase uh pick a friendly unit holy within 12 that unit gets to charge 3d6 and can attempt an 18 inch charge okay. which is huge yeah, there's um, all your pluses as well like so yeah um, again you know that that means that our, a unit of our boys uh, can potentially be going 22 inches and i've got pretty close to that before um so yeah, yeah like that yeah it just catches your opponent by surprise uh you know they think they'll think they're safe off to one side and next thing they know they've got 10 brutes in their face um out of nowhere um the reason i take two obviously you can only try it once per uh per phase but um firstly a war charter might die and mm-hmm. secondly normally i'll have a one war charter on each side of the field so situationally there might be one turn where i need it for one and then the next turn i need it for the other um so it's just kind of that redundancy um so yeah um i have taken the others like fixing beat which is on a four up heal d3 wounds like it's fine but Healing maybe one or two wounds compared to getting an 18-inch charge, it's not much of a contest. Uh, and then Killer Beat is good, which is pick an enemy unit within 12 on a 4-up, you get plus 1 to hit. Um, that means that, you know, the nice thing which we haven't said with Iron Jaws is almost everything is 3s threes and 3s. Threes, yeah. So that puts it to 2s and 3s. Um, so that definitely, you know, helps with the efficiency, and that's a good one. Like, they're all worth taking, um, but I just think getting beat is, yeah, that bit better than the others. Yeah, one hundred percent. Especially with all the other shenanigans you got to move on. Like literally, like at this point, like I know you know the Maddox, but I feel like you know I need to write them all down to try and remember who I was to play. But what <laughs> I will say is that if you are, you know, like wanting to play Angels at this point, or even you maybe have started them already, um, definitely if you haven't already, and I'm not affiliated with them or anything else, but they are they do generally just a good job. Uh, check out AOS Reminders um, because it will have all the rules listed. Basically, you type your army list in there, and it tells you what rules you have to do, when and how, so then you can remember all this. So, because with the amount of charge bonuses, you're going to need to, right? <laughs> you can yeah. get in this. But, but no, that's cool. And like you say, it's a four up, so you can't guarantee it, but I don't know, at least it's not like a five up. You know, just like, at least it will go off sometimes, half the time. Yeah, exactly. Half the time it goes off. It's, it's something which, yeah, you don't play for it to happen. But, you know, even if you've got yourself into like a 10 inch charge range, you know, you put that on, now suddenly you're rolling 3d6 for a 10 inch charge, which means you should be making it compared to before. Yeah, agreed. Um, So the next one to uh, go over is actually going to be the Iron Jaws Spell Law. So you can choose Mm -hmm. or roll for one spell from the following table for each Iron Jaws wizard in an Iron Jaws army, i.e. a weird knob shaman, unless there's a way to make a mega boss or wizard, blah, 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 right? Or War Chanter. Mm -hmm. Um, no, there's not. It's just yeah, okay. just shaman. That's just, they should have just. Well, I suppose future proofs it, doesn't it? In case there's yeah. Um, anyway, so law of the weird. Now we know that. Uh, where is it? I'm trying to quickly. Am uh, I blind? I was literally going to go to like the hand of Gork. Yep. Is it here? Am I blind? Yep. Should be number four, I think. Four. Oh, sorry. I was literally looking for just H, but it's the. A great big hand of gore. Okay, I've got you. Um, so obviously yep. we know that one's good. Um, well, we can talk about it in more details, but we've we sort of covered it. Yeah, it's just it's just there the one really cool thing with it is it, it's pick a unit only within twenty four. So uh, yep. like your your general doesn't even have or no sorry your wizard doesn't even have to be next to them. Um, it's just yeah, it's got a huge range on it. Um, but yeah, like probably ninety percent of the time maybe more if you've got a shaman you're taking it for that spell um how often do the you other take two... two shamans hmm? how often do you take two shamans um not often. not often um yeah you'd be you'd be leaning into i mean it's just these days with your zinches and your seraphons and your lumineths it's just not viable uh, for this army to go heavy magic it's not what they do well um they have got a couple of other good spells, um, but they they've got a casting value of an eight, which is pretty bad time. So you'd you'd need to be really leaning into it. Um, Bashram Lad, which is add one to wound rolls. Um, uh, you know, it makes it very easy to get your army on twos. Well, yeah, your army on twos and twos. Um, 
which is pretty brutal. Um, and the Wrath of Gork, I've seen people really lean onto this, uh, lean into this um, by using a Beowind Vortex with it. Um, basically, it's pick an enemy within 16 uh, and visible. Well, two dice for each friendly Iron Jaws units with two or more models wholly within 16 inches. For each two up, you uh, roll. You, for each two up you roll, you inflict one mortal wound. Um, the reason for the bail wind is it goes to 22 rather than 16 inches. But yeah, say you've got uh, five units, which is uh, not very often you will. If you have them all around your wizard at the start of the game, um, on average that's going to be eight mortal wounds at 22 inch range. Um, so, like, some potential good sniping uh, opportunities there. Mm. But that's kind of an exception. You have to, re again, you have to really lean into that yeah, being how you want to play. Um, and just to say, like, if you get the plus six, just so we understand, is that um, to your uh, range because of you on the Bellwind, is that going to be yep. plus six to, for you to pick the enemy unit and to see how many Iron Jaws units are in range or just for the enemy unit? Um... I'm pretty sure um, it's the, the spell effect is the six, or it's just the spell range, which is the sixteen, in, yeah, which is the, that, that's the enemy same, unit. That's I think. Um, it's not something I've actually thought about. Um, I, 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 I would think naturally to me, it's just to pick the enemy unit, but I was just in case there was anything else you need. But I think because it doesn't feel, it, uh, yeah, picking your units doesn't feel like the spell effect. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. It could, I be, think, it could be. Yeah, the, you know, that's that's how you play. I think, to be honest. If you try and play it any other way, and I don't know, but for my own personal opinion, it's like uh, uh, kind of one of those things, isn't it? Where sort of Dan on the Honest War Gamer sort of refer to some stuff uh, yesterday, and it's like, <laughs> you know, basically, are you trying to misinterpret a rule to break other rules in the game? <laughs> and can I do it? Answer: No. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, uh honestly guys i mean i don't want to talk about the faq because i already did a video on it but if you want to have a good laugh but watch the honest war gamers review of the faq if you're watching this in a year from now you probably don't know what i'm talking about <laughs> but it's fine okay so now we're going to have a look at the uh, battalions for the iron jaws so you'll you'll see them come up now and the um first one we're going to look at and just to say how these battalions are going to work is they're kind of like there's a battalion for each one of the three units you get, you know, Ard Boys, Brutes, and uh, Gore Grunters. And then you've got a few, a, a couple like mixture ones as well. So go with the third one. And I've actually played against this. And it's going to be the Ard Fist. And it's going to be a one Uruk War Chanter and three to five Uruk Ard Boy uh, units. So what you get is a Drawn to Warg. So you can use this command ability. If the Uruk War Chanter from the battalion is on the battlefield, and when a unit from this battalion is destroyed, if you do so, roll a dice on a 4 plus a new Uruk Arboys unit with 10 models is added to this battalion. Set up the uh, new unit wholly within 6 inches of the edge of the battlefield and more than 9 inches from any enemy units. So when I played against this, it was again with my Bone Reapers, I managed to kill one of his units. Ideally, he was trying to leave it on just one wound, but I managed to kill it. And then he summoned Urukar boys right behind my catapult and then charged my catapult. And then it was like, ah, like you got me kind of moment, uh, which was uh, which was good because even when you come on from the board edge with all your pluses you're getting to cast, it ca uh, not cast, sorry, all the pluses you're getting to charge, um, it can just make you get that charge on that turn, which is useful. Mm -hmm. And that, so that's just my experience of it. But what what are your experiences with this? So, firstly, it's worth noting that this has been FAQ'd. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, so so it, the, the wording says that you get um, in the book is that you get uh, a unit of ten Ard Boys back. The issue is that is that you used to be able to run three units of five Ard Boys, get them killed, and then hopefully bring in uh, units of ten, uh, which was funny. Um, <laughs> yeah, imagine. But now it's just you just bring the same size unit um, back you destroyed. Oh, cool. Um, well, that means that guy should have had 15, so that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, that's so, cool. like, in th in theory, this is a, re is a pretty strong battalion. Hmm. The big issue, as we've talked about, is in a world where you've got your Zinches and your Seraphons who can do board-wide pretty much killing, they're going to be gunning for your War Chanter. And the moment that War Chanter dies, then you lose that ability. Yeah. Uh, and I think that if you didn't have... If you could ensure your war chart has stayed alive i think it's a competitive battalion uh but i think as it is um you know against the you know against anything which can reach out and kill him it's just a waste of time yeah exactly 
And like when we're talking about this, we're, we're often talking about in a competitive mindset of like you're going to a tournament, you don't know what you're going to fight. Obviously, if you know you you just play with your your local mates when we can all game and stuff again, or you're in New Zealand having a hell of a time, um, and you go like my mate doesn't have any like range damage abilities. It's like cool, take this fucking one then, have a great time. Um, but obviously, we're talking you know as the meta as a whole um, here. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you know that your your local meta is all sort of heavy combat armies, then run it, take it, you'll have a great time. But yeah, if you know that your war shop needs to get sniped by the guys you play, yeah, maybe consider a different one. Yeah, because uh, like some of the sniping at the moment as well, because it's done free magic, it's like, if you're thinking, well, maybe if I have my guy next to my R boys to get look out, so it, it just is going to bypass all that because it's more wounds like in hearing phases and stuff. So, exactly. yeah. Okay, so going on to what I'm just going to say is probably going to be my favourite. Don't know what the rule is yet, but let's have a go. It's going to be the Brute Fist, right? So three to five are Brute units, and you pick one Brute boss from a unit, so that's the leader of that unit, in the battalion to be the battalion's big boss. And that model has a wound cache that's got five instead of three. So you have a Brute with a wound cache that's got five, so he's practically a hero, and with his attacks, he pretty much is. So... When we go on to its abilities, it's Green Skin Battering Ram. So, after a model from this unit in the battalion makes a charge move, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of that model and roll a dice. On a 4+, plus, the enemy unit suffers one mortal wound. If that model's unit has more than one model, roll to determine if a mortal wound is inflicted each time a model from that unit completes a charge move but do not allocate the mortal wounds until all of the models in that unit have moved cool that's fine it's just like don't allocate the damage until it's all done um all right it's a four plus brutes are not hordes so you're not rolling too many dice uh, i like it and i know it's probably not going to be the best one but i i like brutes so i'm i'm sticking with this one because i'm going to say right what's the max size unit of brutes you can run uh, I'm gonna guess twenty. Okay, maybe. so, you, so yeah. obviously you're taking twenty brutes in your army, right? Just as a, like you know, an auto include yeah. at this point. Twenty dice and a four up, ten mortal wounds on the charge, Alex. I mean, why am the I only, not seeing this? Because it, every model of that unit has to end within an in, their charge within an inch of an enemy unit. Um, so like, if you charge in two ranks, you're only getting that first rank to uh, do the mortal wounds. You had to go talk about the details now, didn't you? Uh, I did. Sorry, but no, that's no, but just like one massive stretched out line. Uh, no, okay, that's yeah. the thing with charge wording because, like, there's certain units where, like, like I think it's uh, Death Riders in OBR where you just roll a number of dice for the number of models in the unit. So even if exactly you just tag right, a yeah. unit with one horse, you roll for all of them. Whereas then for like, other ones like this or like the Gore Grunters uh, on their War Scroll, it's yeah, it's every unit. Um, it's every model that ends within an inch of an enemy model. It's just sad, really, isn't it? I like, guys, but it's not. I'll be honest, my views on battalions are often, that is way too strong, or why do they even write it? So this fits somewhere in the middle, I find. Oh, yeah, if you're, if you're wanting, like, oh, so going through heavy isn't necessarily the most competitive build, but they are the best models in the range, I think. So if you want mm. to go heavy brute, Run the brute fist like it's still a good, but you know it's still mortal wound output. It's still low in your drops. It's still giving you another artifact. It's still giving you another command point. Like it's solid. Um, like go for it. But there is um, another one in a minute where you could do the same in terms of going brute heavy, and it's probably a little bit better. But I, I know it's what you're going to say. But if you want to get, yeah. you know, because brutes can be battle line, right? So oh, they are battle line. Yeah, uh, they're just standard battle line. Um, so you could go entirely brutes, and it, again, it's it's thematic. You know, it really feels like you know these big hulking brutes are smashing in and like causing mortal wounds left, right, and centre. Like it's really cool. I will still say that playing with brutes is the best battle line I've ever had for a great time. Right? Like, Definitely. Really brilliant. Uh, just to quickly say, uh, talking about points as well, because we've kind of moved on to that now. So the art is 120 points. And the uh, Brute Fist is actually going to be 120 points. So not expensive in points. And you remember, you're getting that artifact. You're getting that command point, which you both want, right? The command point may be a bit more. But, like, so it's still going to be useful. Like, if you, you know, like we said, this is more of a... If you want to be the most competitive you can, you're not taking this one. But if you, you know, still want to have some it's fun... It's not attacked. Like, there's no, yeah. there's nothing about it that's attacked if you're wanting to go Brute Heavy. It can like, include your battle line, you know, your free battle line. 
as an example. Yeah. Um, yeah, so cool. So the next one is going to be, you know, basically what the Gore Grunter one is. So the Gore Fist, which is three to five Uruk Gore Grunter units. And again, you pick one of the Gore Grunter um, boss from the unit in this battalion to be the battalion's big boss. And that model has a wound casualty of seven instead of five. That is huge, right? <laughs> that's, that's a huge amount of wounds. Yeah. Um, and then you've got the abilities, which is the boss's big idea. So in your hero phase, um, each unit from this battalion that has wholly within 18 inches of the big boss from the same battalion at the start of the hero phase can make a normal move but cannot run. So you can see just how far you can move with these guys, right? Yeah, um, this is really good. Um, if money wasn't an object, I would run the Gore Fist. Uh, I would just run all Gore Grunters. Um, but unfortunately, they're really expensive models. Um, but yeah, it's really strong. You know, like if you wanted to lean it, you know, say you go Iron Suns where you minus one to hit first turn. Um, you know, if your entire army is moving 18 inches, um, you know, even if your opponent has the um, capacity to fight back and, and kill enough, you know, it's going to be turn three. Like you're, you've already hopefully capped a whole load of the objectives. Oh yeah, I've had this where um, it was a, it was back in the day where um, the battle plan was different to now. But I was playing Scorched Earth. Uh, my uh, opponent charged me with his Gorgrunters turn one. I was running an elite army. He burned all my objectives. It's changed now, so I don't think he can do that. But uh, and then I was sitting there, my first turn, no objectives on my side. And I was just like, because I was just surprised at how fast these guys can move. And uh, what I will say, and I know it ties into the Iron Fist we're going to look at in a moment, but if you're thinking about playing this army and you've only just glanced at the War Scrolls, let's say, or you're going to play against this army and you've only just glanced at the War Scrolls, you think, they're not actually really that fast. This is such a fast army. Like, yeah. Like, I don't want to say, like, almost like, no, not ridiculous because that points to it being like too powerful but like it's um it's incredibly fast um for you like you look at you know brutes like movement like four yeah they're not that slow at all and then going on to the iron fist which is really going to help this because it has the organization is three to five or brutes or gore grunters or auric ard boys units in any combination and you pick one of the brute boss or gore grunters and essentially it becomes the big boss and you add two to whatever wound cash it had but what you get is up and at them. So once in your hero phase, so e once in each of your hero phases, the big boss from this battalion can use the Mighty Destroyer's command ability as if they uh, were a mega boss and without spending. A okay, yeah, that is that is good. I can see why people take the Iron Fist all the time. <laughs> I'm actually this yep. kind of how it goes. Uh, yeah. So like basically, um, it being three to five units of brute score grunters and hard boys. Um, that's really your entire. That's everything but your heroes. Like you are very rarely taking more than five units. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of a reason to. So it's really good for lowering your drops because you can just take everything you want to take. There's no restrictions. And then yeah, you know, um, I yeah, it's amazing. Again, it's another fight. Basically, five free command points. Shove it. You know, if you make your if you have say six uh, Gorg Hunters, uh, and you make him the battalion boss. You know, one of those models. Um, your opponent is having to work through 25, 32 wounds before they can get rid of that ability. Um, so yeah, it's huge. And you know, if you go clanless, so you run brutish cunning and iron fist, you've got basically ten free command points. Yeah. No. Nah, it's great. Yes. Uh, it's a pretty much all I ever run. Um, yeah. As I said, I would I would run the Gore Fist if I had the models, um, but the Iron Fist is, is yeah, these days it's the one to go for. It's the most flexible and it's the most competitive. Is that exactly. Way to say it? Um, so the Iron Fist is going to cost you 160 points and the Gore Fist is 130. So the Iron Fist is obviously the most expensive as we've seen so far, but it's just got such a good benefit to it. Because I exactly. would, if this was like a normal battalion in a normal book, you know, I don't know, the Glooms by Gitz book as an example, what it will be is um, you can do the Mighty Destroyers, but you have to sp still spend a command point, which would then just feel like, what is the point of this battalion? You know, like, there well, it's, much it's really point funny it. with, with these battalions, because if you look at the books that came out around the same time, like the city, like oh, the yeah. city's book is so restricted on battalions, or Ogre Moor tribes, like, 
their, their, their battalions are pretty... Although they've got a lot, and they, some of them are good, they're still really quite restrictive. This is Whereas kind of more like with, with, the, the with this, you just like, take what you want, go through it, have a laugh. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, the, I think... And obviously, not an expert on this book, but it feels like it's been written very well. Um, and this yeah, is the internal balance is amazing in this book. This there's is, no, there's not really any bad decisions. No, exactly. In terms of lift building. Yeah, and this is just like a third to a half of the book, right? Mm -hmm. But there's everything else which I'll get to in different videos. But like, that's cool. But before we get too carried away, there is one more battalion called the Weird Fist. So, one Uruk Weird Knob Shaman and three to five Uruk Brutes, Uruk Ardboy units in any combination. So, Weird Energy. So, if the Weird Knob Shaman from this battalion is wholly within 18 inches or two or more uh, units from the same battalion that each have 10 or more models, it can use the Brutal Power ability to attempt to cast Green Puke twice in addition to any other spells it can cast instead of only one uh, instead of only once um firstly i'll say meh but in terms of explaining it so the <laughs> shaman uh has an ability so it's uh, an ability it's war scroll spell is the great is the green puke which is basically roll 2d6 um that is basically whatever you roll that's how many inch line you draw any units uh, that pass across it yours or your enemies takes d3 mortal wounds um, so a pretty meh spell, but and the ability is um, at the end of your hero phase. Um, if your uh, shaman is close to another unit, um, you can cast the green puke in addition to any other spells. Um, so, like, say you cast the hand of gork, you could then cast the green puke spell at uh, at the end. This is just letting you do that twice. So yeah, it's meh. Yeah, and. Also, it's like if they have ten, of, like just like they just chuck another restriction on it, right? Yeah. And this thing's one hundred forty points. So like it's twenty points more than the hard fist, or the brute fist. Yeah, like, ten points more the than only, the ball fist. The only benefit is is that, um, you know, again, you can take all of your units and a shaman, so it's just lowering your drops one more. He, but you just can't no. take the gore grunters with it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you want gore grunters because they're fun. Yeah, exactly. Um. So with that, in case I I don't think I, oh no I have missed something. Apologies, guys. I am on it. I know you are going to ask me what are my thoughts on the brawl. Right, Alex. <laughs> what is your hot takes on this battalion? So I'll just read out the organization first. One Uruk Mega Boss, one Uruk War Chanter, one Uruk Weird Nor Shaman, and three to five Brute Golf. So Brute Fist, Golf Fist, Ard Fist, or Weird Fist, or Iron Fist War Scroll battalions in any combinations. Your abilities is Boss War. So. Once per battle, if your general is from this battalion and is on the battlefield, another orc hero from this battalion can use the Iron Jaws War Command ability. This does not stop the general from using the Iron Jaws War Command ability, but you cannot use the Command ability more than once in the same combat phase. Right, Alex, how many times have you run this brawl? Uh, never, but it is possible to run it at 2,000 points, I believe. Oh, is it? So I don't know if you I... could sense the sarcasm in my announcement for that, but <laughs> is there? No. Yes, you run this. But like, is it like you can run it, but you never win because it's terrible. So <laughs> yeah, basic, yeah, so basically you, the run three, you, run, yeah, you run three Iron Fist, two minimum size unit of our boys and a unit of Brutes, uh, and then you take the rest of the heroes. And in theory, I believe that is bang on 2,000. I could be wrong. Um, but someone, yeah, someone let us know in the comments, don't we? Someone let us know. It's, yeah, you know, you're spending 324, 80, like 600 points on battalions. I know, I know. I know. It's, it's a, it's a non-starter. Yeah. What I would say, though, is, right, there was a point in Age of Sigma where they filled battalion, so they filled a battle tome up with three mega battalions, is what we call this, and then three normal battalions, which was terrible because, like, it was very hard to take the mega battalions unless you are playing a huge game. But I like it that they still include one because there's also there's there's like a page of lore on this thing, right? There's a page of a story behind it, and um, that's because like when I have been to Warhammer World for as an example, uh, I booked one of the big tables I had up there for a day, and I just brought like um, I think like eighteen thousand points of death, and I didn't have a mega battalion for my death. But if I did at that time, I would just fill it all, and you just have a great time for like, like once in two year game sort of situation. So it's nice, but obviously you know. If you build up a huge Iron Jaws collection, 
cool. <laughs> it's, it's something to aim for, isn't it? Yeah, like, I, I think it's cool, right? Like, and it just gives, like, I'm not going to read out the law, but, you know, you've got a huge page of it here. Um, just that adds to the feel of it. And it really is. Uh, well, I suppose they can call it the Big War, could they? Because then it's, that's the name of the other allegiance. But, like, I really feel that this should have been called the Big War. Or Iron Jaws yeah. War. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Missed opportunity in my opinion but anyway uh, so with that guys that is actually going to conclude our review of inside the book and like we've we spent a fair amount of time on this i think to be fair we've covered everything they've got in the book so really obviously like i know haven't gone over war scrolls we will do that in another video i have actually reviewed all their war scrolls and i don't think they've changed all too much but i will review them again at some point when i do a long army series on the iron jaws but what i will say to Basically, to summarise this video, sort of to end it, is to go back to our first question. So, to you, Alex, why play this army over another army? Um, because you just want to have fun bashing people up, playing with some of the coolest models that Games Workshop have done, um, not having to think too hard while still really enjoying it and getting a huge satisfaction out of playing it. Um, yeah. It's just, I mean, fun. We keep saying it, but it's a, it's probably the most fun army you can play in AOS, I, I believe. Exactly. So with that, I'm going to say F-U-N. With that, a big fun we've got there. Generally, like, I, I don't want to just generalise everything when I just go, <laughs> this is fun, that's fun. Honestly, though, this army is uh, it's one close to my heart, really. It's um, If I was to do the structure, I do like Ogre Moor Tribes and Gloom Spike Gits. But I would go um, like war clans and then like both both of those are cool. Big wild I like, but Iron Jaws is what really uh, draws my attention. So I I really like it. I've ran it before in old editions and stuff, but yeah, I, I really like the army. And I think if it's an army you're thinking about doing, there are far more uh, obviously everyone's individual, but there's far more strengths to me to do this army than negatives if I was looking to do a new army. Um, so what I want to say to that is I want to give a massive um, thank you to yourself, Alex, for joining me in this video and really sharing your knowledge on the um, Iron Jaws. It's just, I mean, I can do as much research as I want, but it really does help when I get that sort of, you know, like first-hand experience about actually playing the army. And I can hear when you talk about them, your enthusiasm. So thank you very much for uh, joining me in this video. I hope you've enjoyed going over them. And I just say, um, it's just been a... It's just a laugh when you read. I mean, I know we didn't read word for word all the titles of their abilities, but like some things are just like, you know, duff up the big thing. And, you know, they're just. What a laugh, right? Oh, exactly. It's like the mount traits. It's like big and mean and weird and loud and. Like, it's just so. It's, yeah, it's yeah. great. And like all the beats for the uh, the war chanters, there's something beat, aren't they? Like killer beat. It's, like, it's, just... it's like get and beat, killer beat, fix and beat. I'm gonna... It just does what it says on the tin. I'm going to like... turn on the killer beat on a four up, you know, and then you're just like, obviously bringing, you know, like your bigger. Uh, uh, you know, I was going to say like a, a big stereo player, but I suppose these times it's just like an iPod or something, isn't it? But you bring that and you start playing music, right? Presumably. Um, but, so yeah, I want to say thank you very much for joining me and uh, giving me your time to do this. It's been a great fun. Uh, what I also want to say is thank you very much to everyone else who's watching this. If you're still watching this video, I mean, we've probably been going on for uh, one and a half to two hours, I want to say, at this sort of point. So thank you very much. I know this is a bit longer than normal, but if you're listening at this point, I'm sure you've appreciated us taking this much time and effort looking into it. Like I say, I'll do more in-depth videos on Iron Jaws at a later date, but I think it was nice now to cover everything that's important for them, talking about a wide play uh, series. Um, so if you did enjoy this video, please smash that like button and that subscribe button if you haven't already. It's that absolutely free for you guys to do so and massively help out the channel and let me know that you are enjoying this content because as I always say, I make content for you. So if I see this has not been very popular, I probably won't return to it much in the future. What I'd also say is that if you are subscribed already, make sure you hit that bell notification as it means that you won't miss any of these sort of videos I do in the future or any other videos I do in the future that you may find useful. What I would like to say though, is that a massive shout out to my patrons as always, as, as liking and subscribing massively helps the channel, my patrons are the reason I can keep going. So shout out to them. So my Morgas, which are Sandbag, Jonathan H, Philco, Bleed Red, my Vampires, which are Mir, Martin S, Rouse321 and David A, and my Necromancers, which is Jack L, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sagas, Wolfnick, Michael W, Quad, and Cranky Wombat. Guys, like I say, 
Massive shout out to you. Thank you so much for keeping the channel afloat. I can't thank you enough and you have so much appreciation from me. What I would also like to say is if you'd like to support the channel a step further than just liking and subscribing and bell notification and everything else, uh, please consider becoming a patron. You'll find a link to my Patreon at the top of the description down below. If you clicked on it and even just consider giving a dollar a month, I'd be hugely appreciative. But if you can't, guys, absolutely no worries at all. And also, if you've got any more questions the Iron Jaws or anything you'd like to see in the future, or, you know, bring on Broken Realms, you know, Gordrak, we all want to see that book come, let me know down in the comments. I'll be happy to have conversations with you about Iron Jaws. Like I say, absolutely really fun army. And um, tell if there's anything that you uh, disagree that me and Alex have said, of course, let us know. We're all here to learn. None of us know the absolute 100% perfect way to do anything. So we're all here to learn. So let us know that. But alternatively, anything you've agreed on, it's always nice to hear that we've been right. So feel free to let us know however you want. But what I will say, guys, is um, thank you very much for watching this video. Above everything else, I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, remember to stay safe, wash your hands, Wear masks, stay hygienic so we can all start playing it again. Please stop licking each other's hands, guys, in certain other countries. It's really not helping. But more importantly, remember, until next time, that Nick Gash is all, and all is one in the Gash. And we are done. Sweet. Cool, thanks.